us like complimentary Turkish coffee, like brought it to our table. It's like a little cheap place. Right. I have patients that love that place. Anybody that has Turkish coffee. It is legit. Like it is. You can get to it. Yeah, my wife will remember, but it's really good. And there's a place in um, Hampton Station. Size, uh, they, brought, they brought out this like the, the naan they brought up was like warm, like fresh, like it's like a pillow. It's like you know, not not bought from Publix, you know. Yeah. There's one of the, and it's like a the family runs it, which feels like a real like authentic kind of place, but like the kind of place that could kill it if they were in like downtown Greenville, right. right? like would kill it. But that would have bread. Well, and uh, it's a meaty yes, meat meat. Yeah. Good morning. Welcome to Grace and Peace Presbyterian Church. Uh, my name is Joe Dennessy. I'm associate pastor here. Uh, we're so glad that you have chosen to spend your Sunday morning with us here. Uh, I know that there's a, a lot of places that you could be, uh, maybe even in bed. And so thank you for getting up and joining us. Uh, if it is your first time here, uh, we especially want to thank you. I uh, want to encourage you to make sure you grab a bulletin, which will guide you through our order of worship but it's also got a lot of helpful information uh, as far as like contact information, uh, a little bit about what makes us tick as a church, and it's got announcements on the back. And so I want to highlight some announcements on the back. Uh, the first thing I want to highlight is uh, putt putt glass. What is putt putt glass, you ask? I am so glad you asked. Uh, it's a men's putt-putt event that we're going to do. Pretty low-key, but should be a lot of fun. I really want to encourage you to sign up on our website. Uh, we're going to go to McPherson Park. Uh, we're going to have hot dogs. We're going to putt-putt, and then we're going to get a hit liability brewery afterwards. And it's really just an opportunity to laugh with other men in the church. If you're new to the church, if you're old to the church, we want to facilitate opportunities, uh, fun opportunities for us to get to know each other better. Um, a way maybe that we don't get to in just the passing of the peace. And so no distractions of families or children, no offense, families or children. Uh, but putt-putt glass, um, men, look at that, register for that uh, even now. We've also got youth group tonight, so if that's you, make sure you come. And if you can believe it, we have already begun planning for art camp. Uh, if you're new to Grace and Peace Art Camp, well, I'm not going to talk about art camp. What we're going to do is we're going to have an announcement by the incomparable Laura Blank. But first, we're going to watch a video.
morning. Watching that video makes me so excited. Art camp was how we first connected to the church before we even came. Jean Johnson, the incomparable Jean Johnson, invited my family to help, and it has become our favorite time of year, maybe besides Christmas. So today, registration opens for art camp. It is July 8th to the 11th. It's from 4 to 7 p.m., and dinner is served, so you do not have to cook that week. You can see our theme here. It's called Light in the Dark. It's going to be so much fun, but let me tell you a little bit more about it. If you have not participated in this amazing annual event, it is a free camp for all children in our community, grades kindergarten through fifth grade, and we explore God's love for us through visual art, creative art, and Bible lessons. Plus, as you can see from the video, we do like to have a little bit of fun with the kids. Um, so register online today. You can see the QR code is in today's bulletin. You can also go to our website, which is graceandpeaceprez.com, and sign up. I do want to note, if you are thinking about volunteering, there is child care available for all kiddos of volunteers. Kids ages 0 to 5 will have nursery care for them, and will also provide dinner for them as well. So if you have any questions, if you want to know more about Art Camp, I will be available between services. You can also email us. The Art Camp team is artcamp at graceandpeacepres.com. We are so excited to start Art Camp, so go register today. Thanks, Laura. Well, we have gathered this morning, we gather every Sunday uh, for worship. And maybe it's your first time in church in a while. Maybe you're not sure what it is. You're, what, what, what are we doing here? And you know, I don't know what you bring into this room. I don't know what kind of week that you have had. I don't know if when you checked the news this morning and you saw tensions escalating in the Middle East, that brought you anxiety. I don't know if you have had tensions at home. Wherever you have been this week, whatever this week looks like, Jesus is calling us to himself, and that's what we're doing. He's calling us to himself that he might give us himself, because what we need more than anything is to be met by Jesus. So let's stand as God calls us to worship from Isaiah 55 and Psalm 34, and anywhere you see bold in the bulletin is an invitation to respond out loud. Come. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you call us into your presence. But we confess, even upon your invitation, we need your help to worship you. We need your help to see you. And so would you draw near to us now? Would you help us to catch a glimpse of who you are? Holy Spirit, would you dig out for us ears to hear? Would you give us eyes to see the risen Christ? And we pray this in his name, praying as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing together. Lift our voices. Jesus shall reign wherever Thus is success and journeys His kingdom stretch from Sure to sure, till moon shall rise and set. People around a merry tongue dwell on his love and sweetness, and every voice shall. Sings all day. 
This morning's Old Testament reading comes from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. The word of the Lord. We have a privilege this morning in receiving new members uh, to Grace and Peace's membership. And so I would like to invite Jeff and Brianne Caffrey and Drew and Emma Hughes to come forward. Uh, membership, church membership, if you're wondering, uh, is a serious, it's a serious thing. We don't take vows very often in our lives. Uh, marriage and maybe with some jobs, uh, and so when we take vows before God and witnesses, it's something to take seriously. And so I'm so glad that you guys are here this morning. It has been a privilege to get to know you guys a little bit better. And I look forward to getting to know you even more. Um, you each have gifts, and we're, pr we're privileged and thankful that you have chosen to share your gifts and your time with this church. And we look forward to sharing our gifts with you. Uh, once you take these vows, we need you and you need us, and we are thankful that God is going to meet us as we serve him together. And so I've got a few vows for you. All of you being here present to make a public profession of faith are to assent to the following declarations and promises by which you enter into a solemn covenant with God and his church. Do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure, and without hope, save in his sovereign mercy, do you? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners, and do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel, do you? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ, do you? Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability, do you? And do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace, do you? Let me pray. Father, we are thankful that you call, you call us to yourself, that when we were running from you and we have run from you in many ways, that you have pursued us uh, through community and through the scriptures, and we thank you that the gospel calls us home. And I pray for these two families, uh, for Drew and Emma, uh, for Jeff and Brianne, and we ask that you would continue to pursue them by your spirit, 
that you would continue to knit them to yourself, that you would strengthen their marriages, that you would use them to edify this body and that you would use this body to edify them. We praise you for their presence in our midst and we praise you that you gather a people together. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Good morning, grace and peace. We come now to a time in which we're going to confess our sins together. Um, and maybe um, as you do this, you feel kind of like a, a one-trick pony. You know, maybe you feel like every week you come and you confess the same sins over and over again. I, I've certainly been there, um, and there's plenty of sins to confess. Um, I, as we were reading this morning, I was thinking about Adam and, you know, the fact that you, you wonder how did he confess? Like, what did that look like for him? You know, and surely when he confessed, every time... I mean, every time a thorn came up from the ground, he was thinking of the curse, and he was thinking of the ways that the ways that his own sin had brought that about. And yet, hopefully, he was also considering the fact that the gospel was proclaimed to him, even in that moment. And that as he looks back on his own sin, and he's, as he pulls the thorns out of the ground, he's thinking that um, that ultimately his sin is going to be dealt with not by him, um, but by the Lord. And we know, looking, we know as we confess our sins, that those thorns, though they prick us, uh, were placed on the head of our Lord. And so, come with me together, and let's let's confess. I will read the uh, plain print, and we'll read the bold together. Lord, you are our Father, and we are but dust and filth. You are our Creator, and we are the work of your hands. You are our Shepherd, and we are your flock. You are our redeemer. We are the people that you have purchased. You are our God. We are your inheritance. Therefore, do not be angry with us to correct us in your fury. No longer remember our iniquity to punish it, but chastise us gently in your kindness. Your wrath is kindled because of our demerits, but remember, that your name has been pronounced over us and that we bear your mark and standard and continue rather the work that you have begun in us by your grace that all the earth might know that you are our God and our Savior. Amen. We'll silently confess now. And now listen to our assurance of grace. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing and generation and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So as we have received this assurance of grace, passed this assurance of grace and the peace of Christ to one another.
kind of passed his own way home where it's like 6 o'clock and they're at, it's backed up traffic. I was like, you know, you. maybe another day. Yeah, we, I mean, I only go when I'm around here. That's fair. Um, so but, this uh, is so close. <laughs> and we used to go every Sunday after. Oh. As like a young, like, professional group. Yeah, with like all yes. um, And then it kind of died after COVID. <laughs> so I really don't know. Well, let's continue in our time of worship this morning. We place our trust and our hope on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. Let's sing this together. sing together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the Son, At this time, I'm going to invite our four and five-year-olds to come meet in this corner. We'll pray for them before they go down to their activities. If you're visiting us and you have a four or a five-year-old, they are invited as well. We would just ask that you go downstairs and check them in at the check-in desk. Sometimes it's a race to see who can get here first, and sometimes it's a race to see who can get here last. All right, let's pray. God, you are the giver of good gifts, and we acknowledge to you that these children are good gifts uh, in their families and in this church family. And we thank you for the ways that you are pursuing them even now and ask that you would be with them and their teachers as they learn about 
the Great Commission. And we pray that you would give them and their teachers patience and affection for one another, and that you would use this, um, along with so many other things, to bring them to this table soon. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Have fun, guys. So I'll let you know, um, I goofed and put the wrong passage in our bulletin, so I want to give you a heads up that if you want to use the Pew Bible in just a few moments, uh, it'll be on page 885. But before we get to that, I wonder if you've ever had the moment where you're sitting maybe in public, I guess it must be in public, and you think that you're sitting next to somebody rich and famous. Have you ever had this moment? You think it's somebody that you've seen on television, you've heard on Spotify, but you're not quite sure if it's them because it's real life. And I'll give you an example. Ten years ago or so, uh, Melissa and I were on an airplane, and I was pretty sure that Axl Rose was like three rows in front of me. And then we went to baggage claim, and I'm standing next to who I think is Axl Rose. I'm like, it's got to be him. Like, I took a picture and posted it on Facebook, as we did back then. I was like, is this Axl Rose? Everybody's like, it is. No, it's not. There's no consensus. And I never asked him. So I have no idea if I was next to Axl Rose. But a week ago, so Melissa and I went to Texas, Austin, Texas, last week for the eclipse, and it was glorious and magic for so many reasons. But as we were in the Austin airport on the way back, I was standing next to somebody in line in the Starbucks in the airport. And I was like, I think this is Tony Hawk. And if you don't know who Tony Hawk is, he was like the skateboarder for decades. He's got over 20 video games named after him. He's kind of a big deal. And we're waiting in line. At one point, we're like sharing a square. And I'm like, I think this is Tony Hawk, but he's just staring at his phone. And nobody's really saying anything, and no one's really making eye contact with one another, but you can kind of feel like a lot of us are wondering if this is Tony Hawk. <laughs> there was a moment of clarity, and it was when the barista cried out, I've got a macchiato for Tony, and you could sort of hear a bunch of chuckles to ourself. And then, as if the self-designated spokesman for our little Starbucks cohort, a little five-year-old boy goes, hi, Tony, and we all kind of chuckled. And to his credit, he redirected his path towards this little boy and said hello on his way to his gate. In our passage this morning, we have disciples who are with somebody who is kind of a big deal, Jesus, and they don't yet know it until there is a moment of clarity. And what we're looking at in our passage is sort of a, a part two of what we started last week in Luke 24, where Jesus approaches these two disciples, and they're on the road to Emmaus, and they're dejected. And we know they're dejected because the text tells us they were sad. They have heard from at least a half dozen women who had gone to the tomb and found it empty, came back with a report, angels told us that Jesus has risen. They've also heard from Peter, who ran to the tomb and came back and said, yeah, it's empty. But they have not come to a place yet where they are convinced of the resurrection. In fact, they don't think it's happened at all. And why is this? Because whether it's 2,000 years ago or it's today, believing in resurrection is to enter into a supernatural realm. We know this is not a natural phenomenon. And they're sad. And they're sad because they believe that Jesus has been a failed Messiah. They'd put their hopes in him, and now they feel dejected. And perhaps you have felt this way about Jesus at some point. Have you ever felt dejected by Jesus? Maybe you've done your best to entrust to him something that was so important to you, and he didn't do with it what you had hoped that he would do. He didn't do with it what you asked him to do. And maybe it was a romantic relationship or a health crisis Maybe it was family tension or a job dynamic. Whatever it was, when things didn't go the way that you hoped they would, right or wrong, haven't you felt it? Jesus let me down. And our passage this morning reminds us that rather than letting us down, Jesus always shows up for his people, even if not in the way that we expect him to. And I think we'll find this morning those promises are true even now. And so as you turn your attention to 
Luke 24. I want to read from verses 26 through 35, 20, 28 through 35. So Jesus and these two disciples drew near to the village to which they were going. And he acted as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Didn't our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Let's pray. Gracious God, we ask that you would meet us as you have met us before, as you have met all of your children. And would you help us to be encouraged and convicted in all the right ways? Would you make Jesus more believable and precious in our sight? We pray this in his name. Amen. So, even though I think if you've been following Jesus for a while, we know what it is to feel let down by him. I'm going to assume if you're a follower of Jesus that you actually know he doesn't let down his people. And I'll, I'll assume this because Christians know that Jesus is both good and perfect. That Jesus never makes mistakes. That he never make, breaks promises. And yet we've all experienced seasons where we've pleaded with him for something and he didn't see fit to give us what we wanted. And so while he may not actually let anyone down, we know what it is to feel as though we have been let down. Again, he's always right. But when the realization sets in that he may not do for us what we hoped he would do, haven't you felt it? Distance between you and God that you feel that maybe you hadn't felt before or maybe you hadn't felt in a long time. And when emotionally you circle back to this idea that he is perfect and does nothing wrong, then a lot of us have come to the conclusion, well, maybe the problem is with us. He is perfect. I am not. I am the reason that something has not gone right. And you're struck. I'm the problem. We've talked a lot in this Gospel of Luke about how even Jesus' closest disciples so often missed who he was, even if they used the right vocabulary. In fact, their understanding of who Jesus is and everything they hoped he would be died with him on the cross. A failed Messiah. And at this point, these two disciples don't yet know that there's another Jesus out there, the real Jesus, walking and talking out there, actually right next to them. You know, and we may not miss Jesus to the same degree that these disciples did. We may not think that his sole purpose for coming was to make Israel great again. We may not enter into that world. But we do so often think that he has come to do something other than he has come to do. And we make the same kind of mistakes as these disciples because we have the same nature that these disciples have. We simply want Jesus to want what we want. And we want him to act where we wish we had the power to act. We want him to give us a child. Or we want him to give us financial security or we want him to give us a meaningful, intimate relationship, whatever it is. You know, I think we reform types love to poo-poo the health, wealth, prosperity gospel, the likes of Joel Osteen and Kenneth Copeland. But so often, on some level, we're guilty of the same thing, aren't we? We think, if I follow Jesus enough, hard enough, if I give him enough of my commitment, then he's obligated, isn't he, to give me some of the life that I want for myself. And one of the worst places to be, spiritually speaking, 
is to think that Jesus would treat you better, would be kinder to you if you simply had greater faith. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus draws near to his disciples precisely where we are weakest and precisely where we are most sinful. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus is more committed to his people than his people are committed to him. And Jesus shows that commitment to these disciples by drawing near to them, even when they don't know it's him or what to think of Jesus at all. One commentator I read says, Jesus was there in their despair and heard it all, though they did not realize it. And this is precisely what we need from Jesus, isn't it? For him to draw near to us where we need him the most. And this passage says that he does that sometimes, even when we are oblivious to it. We need someone to draw near to us, not where we are strong, but where we are weak. One who will show us again and again that what we need more than anything else, more than our vision for the happy life, is a crucified and risen Messiah for us. And we need this every day. I mean, Jesus says it this way in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. Do you believe him? So here's a point. While we are more like these disciples than we realize, Jesus continues to promise to move toward us just like he did them. In other words, you don't need to be stronger for Jesus. You need Jesus to draw near to you in your weakness. And I'll say that again. You don't need to be stronger for Jesus. You need him to draw near to you where you are weak. And the math of Scripture says that as Jesus continues to move towards us, what we find isn't so much that we become stronger, but that he becomes our strength. Because he gives us himself. And when he gives us himself, he makes us more like himself. Last week we saw that Jesus drew near the disciples while somehow closing their eyes from recognizing who he is. They're they're speaking with him. They're interacting with him. But they don't know who he is. And we're not told why Jesus prevents them from recognizing him. But my hunch is that he wants to show them, and by extension, us that he opens the eyes of his believers in the same way. The same way today that he did then. Well, how did he interact with them last week? What did we see? He showed them over and over again from the Old Testament how they missed entirely who the Messiah was supposed to be. They had their own preconceived ideas, as so many did, of what the Messiah was and what he had come to do. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Let's look at the scriptures and see who the Messiah is. The the Old Testament says over and over again, he's the crucified and risen one. And it turns out that Genesis is all about Jesus. And Exodus is all about Jesus. And surely not Leviticus. Yes, Leviticus, all about Jesus. All of the Old Testament and all of the New Testament points powerfully to the crucified and risen one. And he shows them it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer. It was necessary for him to suffer in this way and to enter into glory. And so he shows them the Messiah must be the crucified and risen one. But here's the thing. Jesus, while he's teaching them this, while they are moved by this, he must be doing all of this in the third person because they still don't know he's talking about himself but they find him to be compelling. That they are stirred by what he is saying. They are beginning to believe what he is saying. They don't understand it yet, not fully, but they are compelled by it. And we know this because when we get to verse 28, they get to their destination, presumably Emmaus. Jesus pretends to keep going. And in verse 29, we read, they urge him strongly. No, no, don't leave. It's too late. Stay with us. Eat with us. And he does. They want to hear more of the one who is speaking to them about the scriptures. And I think what we see here, and this is important, 
there is a difference between fully understanding and truly believing. There's a difference between fully understanding and truly believing. And so often we conflate the two as if we can't wrap our heads around all of the aspects of the faith and maybe we don't have saving faith. And yet we continue to see in this passage that they did not fully understand. But by the time we get to the end, it's hard to say that they didn't truly believe. So Jesus acts like he's going to keep going even though he has no intention of leaving them. And no, I don't think he is deceiving them. He is choosing in this way to to begin to reveal to them their longing for him. He's choosing in this way to begin to reveal to them their faith in what he is saying, the promises of Scripture, even if they don't fully understand it. And so he accepts their invitation. He goes in to stay with them. But turns out, even though they invited him, he quickly becomes the host. How do we know? Because they they sit down to eat, and Jesus doesn't wait for them to feed him. He takes the bread, and he blesses it, and he breaks it, and he gives it to them rather than the other way around. And we read, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Can you imagine? Now, every commentator realizes that something really special happens here. And I read more than once that some people say that when Jesus broke the bread, that when Jesus breaks bread, he breaks it so perfectly, it looks as if a knife has cut it right down the middle. And so they saw this perfectly cut bread and realized that the risen Christ was right in front of them. I don't find this theory to be particularly compelling. I read it more than once. I think a much better and clearer understanding of this passage will lead us to see that the Son of God reveals himself to his people when he breaks bread with us. Last Sunday night, Melissa and I went to a nice dinner in Austin. We're downtown. Paramount has a concert. Uh, and we're eating at the restaurant right next to it. And we realize that the Paramount has a concert because the line going in wraps around the building, so we kind of have to navigate our way through this crowd. We go into this nice restaurant, and we sit in a pretty small room. There's only four tables. We realize pretty quickly there's a certain energy at one of the tables. And I don't know what it is, but there's, that, those are, that's somebody right there. And so I asked our waiter about it, and he goes, oh, that's Steve Hackett. And I was like, I don't, I don't know who that is. And he says, he was a guitarist for the band Genesis, and arguably their greatest era. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. That's what all the Genesis shirts at these other two tables are. And so you've got four tables. You've got Steve Hackett and his band. You've got me and Melissa, who are just learning about who he is. And you've got two obsessed tables with them. Now, we know they're obsessed because they spoke loudly about Genesis and Steve Hack, my favorite guitar solo. I think this is their best record. And it was comical to us because we couldn't help but think that they hoped that Steve Hack would be like, what was that? And like get up and walk over. Did you say Genesis? I used to be in that band. Let's talk. I, I think that's what they thought was going to happen. It didn't happen, right? What we find at this meal Jesus does not expect us to jump through the right hoops, to ask the right questions, to act in the right way, to plead with enough earnestness. Jesus instead draws near to his people in ways that we don't even know how to ask for. We see something of this one-two punch of word and sacrament in Scripture that Jesus promises to draw near to his people when his word is opened and his bread is broken. Their hearts burned in the hearing of Jesus in the scriptures, but they knew him in the breaking of bread. Word and sacrament belong together in the Christian church. And this is where Christians, we need to remember that we're not naturalists. That there is more to this world than we can see and fully make sense of sometimes. There is more than we can see 
than just atoms and molecules, and we know it. Deep in our bones, we know it. And we know it when we experience love, when we see beauty, or hear beauty in music, listen to it in poetry, see it in a painting, when we feel that something has intrinsic meaning, whether it be something beautiful or catastrophic, we know things matter and there is more to this world than we can see or make sense of. We know this. And Jesus is telling us there is more to this meal than meets the eye. And we're meant to believe this, even though I'm not sure we're meant to fully understand it, even though I'm not sure we're fully meant to wrap our minds around it. But here are a few points to help us understand. The first time that we see Jesus ever taking bread and blessing it and breaking it and giving it, do you remember when that was? It was in the feeding of the 5,000. As if to show us, when Jesus does this, there is more than meets the eye at work, and we use words like miracle to describe it. And those who partook on that day, we read, are satisfied. Well, the second time Jesus takes bread and blesses it and breaks it and gives it, it's at the institution of the Lord's Supper, at the Last Supper. And he teaches his disciples, remember me. Well, here's the third time. It's the first post-resurrection occurrence where Jesus takes bread and blesses it and he breaks it and he gives it. And the eyes of the disciples are opened. What does it mean? They see it, don't they? For the first time, they see it. That when Jesus' body was broken on a cross, his mission wasn't failing, it was succeeding. That what Jesus came to do wasn't ending, it was beginning on the cross when he was broken. And they see that when he was broken, he wasn't just broken to be broken, he was broken for them and their sin. They're beginning to understand that the only way to relate to Jesus is as a sinner relates to Jesus. And they see in this meal that he gives himself for sinners. Just like we do, they want to cover up their weaknesses. But when we see a God who is broken, when we see a Messiah who has been broken, he hasn't been broken for brokenness sake. He has been broken to atone for our sins. Before God, there is no hiding who we are or what we have done. And only in Jesus Christ is this great news well, there's one other place in Scripture post-resurrection where we see this meal. It's in 1 Corinthians, where Paul is telling the churches that you ought to keep doing this. This is a meal for the Christian church perpetually. And he says, the cup of blessing that we, bla that the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And that word participation is communion. That in some way that in this meal, we actually commune with the man, Jesus, body and blood. That in some way, we participate in him. We take him into us. And in doing so, he changes us. And somebody think, well, is this just all a little bit of hocus pocus? I think it's a fair question. Do you know where we get the term hocus pocus from? A misunderstanding of the Latin hoc est corpus meum, this is my body. That's where we get hocus pocus from, this is my body. No, it's not magic. Jesus is only and ever received by faith. And he knew. He knew that these disciples had faith, even if they didn't fully understand what was happening. And how do we know that? Because when, they, when he vanishes, when this flesh and blood Jesus vanishes, that's wild, they say, didn't our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Wasn't something happening in us? Wasn't he working and stirring within our hearts? Weren't we moved by the scriptures? 
By word and sacrament, Jesus revives these dejected men, and not by reviving their dreams for a great Israel, but by showing them that his death and resurrection for them changes everything. Here's what the scriptures teach, and I think especially here, the real Jesus draws near to us when his word is opened and when bread is broken. Here's the thing. In our naturalistic culture, and I think every culture is, we sometimes want Jesus to work in other ways. We have a better idea for how Jesus should work, or we have an idea that we can wrap our head around, this is how Jesus should work. Why does he have to work through physical things like water and bread and wine, of all things? Well, Part of the answer is because it's always been that way from the very beginning. Adam and Eve, we just read it. They took a fruit and they ate it and their eyes were opened. They didn't believe God's word and they ate and their eyes were opened and they saw that they were sinners. And what Jesus has given us in this meal is an opportunity to believe his word and to eat and to find that we have a savior of our sin. The other part of the answer is that Jesus does what he wants to do. And he gets to tell us how his world works. And when we say things like, I wish he worked this way or this way, we start to sound a whole lot like the disciples who said, we had thought that he was the one to redeem Israel. We wanted him to work on our terms. But Jesus is never merely invited someplace. He always becomes the host. That is, he always does things on his terms because he alone is Lord. And the good news of the gospel is that his way is always better than our way. So the crucified and risen Lord truly meets them in this meal, changing everything for them. And how do they respond? They sit around the table all night long trying to hash out exactly what happened? No. No, they get up and they run right back to Jerusalem, seven miles to the other disciples, and they find there what must have been the most life-changing and most joyful fellowship, for they found those who were also convinced of the resurrection. And they said, Peter saw Jesus, and they said, we saw him in the breaking of bread. Do you think they felt silly when they said that? I don't. Do you think they felt like they had to explain what they No, I don't. He met us. You know, we know some of the ins and the outs of what happens at this table, but so much of it we don't understand, and I'm not sure we ever will in this life. But I know what some of you were thinking. You know, I come to this table for weeks, and sometimes I don't feel anything. I'm not so sure he's doing anything in this meal. And to that I would just say, how do you know? How do you know? We know that he can walk and talk with people and then not know it. He can draw so close and for seasons we not be aware of it. But still, what I would commend to you is to be anywhere that Jesus promises to give himself to you. Sometimes he draws near and we don't feel it. And here's what we know. He's promised to do good to us and our children in baptism. He has promised to meet us and feed us at this table. And we're not encouraged to trust our feelings to understand it all. And we're not even encouraged to trust our understanding in it. We're encouraged to believe that Jesus is telling us the truth. Will you believe him? He promises to cleanse us and to meet us, to give himself to us, to make us more like himself. You don't have to fully understand it in order to believe it. You know, the great reformer, John Calvin, wrote hundreds of pages on the sacraments. I mean, the man could talk. And yet, when he closes his massive section on the sacraments, here's what he says. The mystery of Christ's secret union with the devout is by nature incomprehensible. If it's incomprehensible, why are you even talking so long? You know, that's what you think when you're reading them. 
If anybody should ask me how this communion takes place, I'm not ashamed to confess that it is a secret too lofty for either my mind to comprehend or my words to declare. And to speak more plainly, I rather experience it than understand it. Friends, Jesus has promised to be with us now as his word is opened, and he has promised to be with us especially close in this table. As his bread is broken to remind us of his body, as his wine is shed to remind us of his blood. And when he meets us, he begins to compel us to go and share with others that we have been met with the risen Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have preserved your word for us. These words, some 2,000 years, but so many other words in the Bible, 3,000 years, 4,000 years, you are committed to us hearing from you. And we thank you that you haven't just told us good news about yourself but you have given us signs and seals to work this truth deeper into our hearts. And so we pray that you would give us faith that we might meet you or be met by you even now at this table. So now as as we come to this table, we really have the greatest privilege. It's not a naturalistic right. But what Scripture tells us and what we are encouraged to believe is that Jesus is telling us the truth when he meets us in our sin. This is not a table that you have to clean yourself up for. This is a table that proclaims that somebody else has to clean us up. You know, sometimes maybe you've been encouraged, like, if you have sin in your life or you've got this in your life, maybe you shouldn't come to this table. And I think so often that is misguided. Instead, what I would say to you is, if you find yourself in a season where you refuse to repent, if you don't happen to be convinced that Jesus is who he says he is, well, then we would encourage you not to partake. But if you are a struggling sinner whose only hope in life and death is Jesus, then please come to this table. This isn't a meal of grace and peace. It's not even a PCA meal. This is a meal for baptized followers of Jesus. And if that's you... Please come, knowing that Jesus intends to meet with you. Before we come, we give thanks. And so I say to you, lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to our Lord God. It is very good, right, and our duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. O Lord, Holy Father, almighty, everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we praise and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory be to you, O Lord most high. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, and after he blessed it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, and after he had given thanks, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. Drink from it, all of you. At this time, I'm going to invite those who are helping to serve the supper to come forward. And the way that we're going to celebrate this meal together, if it's your first time, is we're going to invite those of you from the back to come forward first. And you'll find two stations with a common loaf and a common cup. And the cup is wine, but we also have individual cups where the wine is red and the juice is clear. And we also have gluten-free options on either side. Well, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them and feed on Christ in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Sing together. 
Jesus, the joy of loving hearts, the fount of light, the light of men, from the best bliss and earth in parts, we turn Jesus, the joy of loving hearts, the fount of light, the light of men, from the best place that earth imparts, we turn and fill to Thee. Truth unchanged hath never stood. Thou savest those that call and we call. To them that seek thee, thou art good. To them that find thee all. of thee, O living red, and long to feast upon me still. We drink of thee, the fountain head, and thirst our souls from thee. Let's all stand together and respond as we often do by looking forward to that day when he will make all things right and new. Let's sing this out together. song of the 
Our gracious God gathers us by his word. He feeds us with his word and sacrament, and now he sends us out with his word. So receive these good words from God. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Now go in the peace of Christ to love and serve all of his creation.